start with the the High Court uh, rule today on they've been dubbed the, the Citizenship uh, Seven. So the uh, six senators and one lower house MP who had questions over whether they were dual citizens, uh, which whether they were eligible to sit in parliament under section 44 of Australia's constitution. Everyone's been trying to predict which way the High Court uh, would go, but in a seven to zero decision, they declared that uh, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, uh, Deputy Nationals, leader Fiona Nash, uh, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts and Green Senators Scott Ludlam and Larissa Waters were all ineligible to sit in Parliament. However, they held that uh, Matt Canavan, who uh, stood aside as a uh, minister, he he was uh, eligible, he didn't hold dual citizenship, and Nick Xenophon was also not found to hold uh, dual citizenship. So he had five out, five out and two in. So it's from my reading of the, the High Court's uh, decision is that they still interpreted Section 44 quite uh, strictly, and it means that potentially more dual citizens, uh, if, they, if they are in the federal parliament, there's a lot of question marks over, over various MPs, they could be knocked out as well. And that's clearly that the High Court uh, came to the view that uh, ignorance of the law was not an excuse and even though they'd never dealt with uh, citizenship by descent, which was the case with Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash, they, they, the High Court still expected those two uh, politicians to do their due diligence and you know, find out whether they had inherited uh, citizenship. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I found this, uh, this a ruling of the High Court to be quite predictable. I was expecting uh, Joyce, um, Nash, Roberts, Ludlam to all go uh, because ignorance, as you mentioned before, is not an excuse. But the, the Canavan and the Xenophon decisions are quite a lot different. For instance, Canavan had no idea uh, that his mother signed him up for an Italian uh, citizenship, and that was very uh, unusual circumstances. And also Xenophon as well, I thought that he was lucky. Um, he renounced his uh, Cypriot citizenship, I believe, but uh, didn't didn't uh, renounce uh, his, his British one that came from uh, Cyprus being a, a British territory at the time. So I found that uh, Xenophon got off lucky, but it doesn't really matter for Xenophon because he is uh, contesting the South Australian state election. Although Canavan uh, is a is a member of cabinet, or I don't know, he might not be anymore, but he was a member of cabinet. And Joyce, and likewise, I believe Nash as well. So these are some really uh, high profile blows for the coalition. And it'll be interesting to see uh, what the result of the New England by-election is. Uh, well, Matt Canavan, he's already been re-sworn in as uh, Cabinet Minister. Ironically, he was the, the only Cabinet Minister who stood aside because, remember, uh, uh, Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash, they chose not to stand aside. And uh, Labor, of course, you know, prosecuted in Parliament, you know, how can, you know, Bar Barnaby Joyce, uh, you know, be making these, you know, decisions about, you know, uh, key, you know, key areas around agriculture and water when there's a cloud over is uh, uh, eligibility and the the Turnbull government was really quite you know arrogant in in not uh, asking that uh, Joyce and Nash uh, stand aside because from uh, what I've been hearing from the news commentary and constitutional experts that section forty section sixty four of Australia's constitution uh, states that a, a minister can uh, can only only not be a member of uh, parliament for three months before their uh, decisions are found to be invalid. So they've actually been on the mass, uh, Barnaby Joyce and Fiona Nash, they've been cabinet ministers for a whole year when they weren't eligible to be in the parliament. So that could even uh, open to challenge the the, uh, the decisions that they made at ministers for the past year and really uh, put our nation in further political limbo. 
Well, I think that this is a lesson learned for everyone, regardless of whether you are One Nation or the Greens or the National Party. You have to follow the Constitution. The Constitution is not some um, uh, ancient document that has no relevance to us. It is the very document unto which our country was founded. Uh, and one needs to have respect for the Constitution. Uh, so I really don't have a problem with these decisions that have been made. Strict interpretations, yes, but it shows to all that the Constitution is a supreme document within the nation and it needs to be respected. And quite frankly, I found it great that the High Court had this courage to make a just and fair decision as they did. Of course, the political fallout from the High Court decision is there'll now be a by-election in the regional New South Wales seat of uh, New England, which uh, Barney B. Joyce uh, held. So at the moment, the uh, the government has uh, lost its uh, one-seat majority. And so I do believe that there's uh, two sitting weeks uh, left before this uh, by-election result is finalised, so uh, Labor will try to cause as much chaos as possible. They probably won't get a no-confidence uh, motion passed because independent Cathy McGowan has said she'll support the government on uh, supply and confidence, but it could... What is being suggested is that Labor and the crossbench and potentially George Christensen could uh, try and get a royal commission into the bank's uh, pass. So there's uh, a lot of political instability that, that will follow in the coming months before this uh, by-election is sorted. Now, uh, Tony Windsor, the former member for New England, has said that he's not running, so Barnaby Joyce will most likely uh, win uh, or retain, uh, should I say, uh, New England, but it's, it's certainly going to lead to a few unstable months. Uh, and, and there's also the possibility of Bob Catter even potentially holding the uh, House of Reps to ransom, you know, asking for um, enumerate things for his uh, northern Queensland uh, constituency. Now, I understand, I, this has slipped my mind, apologies, but there was a Tasmanian senator who held the balance of power in the Senate uh, for quite a while. Brian Do you Haradine, remember? yes. Yes. So I'm thinking that uh, Catter could potentially be in a Haradine-esque situation uh, whereby he, you know, asked for right on lawnmowers for everyone in the uh, North Queensland uh, electorate there. So it would be interesting to see where Bob Catter lies. Uh, in this in this whole debacle, but uh, I, I view Catter as as as, as an honourable man. Uh, he uh, sided with Abbott before. Uh, there's precedent there. He's an old school national. Uh, he doesn't really want uh, turmoil and chaos. He just wants what's best for his electorate. But certainly, I think that uh, George Christensen would be uh, well within his rights to put, uh, push for a royal commission into the banking sector. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, more government intervention is the key, but certainly, you know, elements of uh, monopolisation, well, it's, you know, the, uh, what would you call it, a quad, quadruply, uh, yeah, there's a big four, and, and then there's really hard, you know, with the overbearing regulations, uh, they kind of set their own rules. Um, the banking sector uh, needs to be looked into a little bit. Uh, I think Christensen's right there. Uh, I don't, I don't think overbearing, you know, government uh, intervention or a royal commission is good, but I th certainly think shining the light uh, toward the banking sector uh, can never hurt. Um, but certainly the ramifications of this uh, are extraordinary and it, and it just shows that, uh, well, it just further emphasises the, the, the amount of pressure that... that uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's under uh, if he can't even keep a majority within the House of Representatives. Now, he lost 13 seats at the last election. Now he doesn't even have a majority. He doesn't have his Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, and it's simple that this man is not fit to govern. Uh, and this is all seen through, through the chaos and how he can't keep his house in order. 
Well, he's supposed to be flying to Israel tomorrow, and so we do, in his press conference today, he didn't even tell us who the acting Prime Minister would be, who uh, most people assume will be uh, Julie Bishop, which uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, still hasn't confirmed whether he's going on this trip. There, There is this suspicion that he's a bit paranoid to leave Julie Bishop in charge of the country because of you know what, what she might do while he's away. Yeah, well, he yeah, he's, uh, he's not fit to lead. He doesn't have, um, as Andrew Bolt said on the Bolt Report last night, he doesn't have any political vision or any political capability. Um, he He's unfit to, to lead. He's obviously very worried about the stability of his government. And he obviously this leadership issue uh, is further emphasised through him not being able to uh, have the foresight to see who the uh, acting prime minister will be uh, through his trip to Israel. It just shows how chaotic everything's become. Now, I don't really like to stir the pot too much, but it's quite evident that there is a large degree of chaos in Canberra. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.